How many remember um, some years ago when these four letters, WWJD, was rolled out? Remember that? Yeah, yeah. And so it means what? What? would Jesus do? I mean, I have seen it in recent days. So like there were wristbands made, right? So WWJD, what would, what would Jesus do? And so that kind of became kind of a mantra, kind of like, what would Jesus do? So as I'm traveling through life, you know, and I face different circumstances in life, like what would Jesus do? And then hopefully we would respond that way. So my life might be going really good. Business might be going really good. But what about when business wasn't going so good or maybe life it was a little bit challenging, so WWJD, what would Jesus do? And so just hang on to that for a moment. I have a question to ask you, and it's this. How do you think that's going? Just think about it for a second. How do you think that's going? You have heard me say numbers of times, and I'll continue to say it over and over and over, because it's the thing that drives us, that as followers of Jesus, we must learn to follow him. And so if you've ever played follow the leader, or think of this, you're in traffic, you don't know where to go, but someone is going to lead you, right? So here's what they say, just follow me and I will lead the way. And so with all eyes on that car in front of you, you're watching them because you don't want to what, miss the right-hand turn, you don't want to miss the left-hand turn, you don't want to miss the, the, uh, the on-ramp to the freeway or the exit off the freeway. You need to know where to go. And so you're going to follow that person. Well, Jesus calls us to be followers, and he calls us to do one thing, and that is this, to follow me. Everybody say follow. Follow. Online, you too. Yeah. Follow me. And I'd like to talk about that for just a few moments, and then we're going to dive into the book of Nehemiah and just see how this whole thing plays out. In fact, Jesus says it this way, um, to his disciples. Now, Matthew, um, he says, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, we read, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, doing what they know to do, right? What comes natural because this was their training. Here's what they were doing, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, what? Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. That was the call. Um, not just to believe in me, but to follow me. That was the call. Their invitation was direct, and it came from Jesus. Follow me, and I will make you into something that you are not. I'll make you into fishers of men. They would, they would cease to do what was comfortable to them. They would cease to do what was natural to them. They would cease to do... Um, what their livelihood was, and they would become followers of Jesus. This meant that they would learn how to live life making disciples. That they were being invited into what I'll just call an upside-down kingdom that Jesus introduces us to, and he says this, that no longer will you live your life this way, you're going to treat people this way. No longer will you see people through this lens, you're going to see people through my lens. You're going to follow me. No longer are you going to see what I have given you through your own personal lens. You're going to see it through my lens, kind of an upside-down kingdom. We're going to now see things as Jesus sees them. It was a brand new invitation into life. As they followed him, as they followed him, they would become like him. That was the call. As they followed Jesus, he would transform their thinking, how they would think about life, how would they think about all that they were confronted with. He would transform their thinking. He would transform their very way of life. He would transform how they acted and how they reacted to all of life. I'm going to make you a brand new person. I'm going to make you a fisher of men as you follow me. They would see life and purpose through a brand new lens, through a different lens. And that call is for you and me today. This is what's called 
a biblical worldview. And I talk about that a lot, and I say it this way. Like, we at Gateway are committed to living life and seeing all of life through a biblical worldview. That is, we begin with the Bible. So in here we do our best to teach that. What's happening right now over in the fellowship hall with the kids is being taught from a biblical worldview. What happens here on a Wednesday night when this room is filled with students is from a biblical worldview. What happens in our schools, because we're committed to teaching in all of our schools, the Eagles, Cross Point, our daycare, preschool, is all from a biblical worldview. This is, this is our commitment, that we would do that. You see, the Bible is to form our thinking and our understanding of the world. It's the answer to man's most basic need, salvation, and how to live it. Not the most recent book written by man. Think about that. So often we pick up the most recent book and we go like, oh, this is the way, this is the way. They may be helpful, but we return to the Bible, which forms our thinking and our understanding of the world and the answer to the problems in the world and that you and I face today. The problem is that society today is adopting a worldview based on the current thinking of man and trying to provide answers for a problem that can only be solved through a relationship with Jesus Christ and then following him. Now, why, why talk about this again? Because I, I talk about it a lot. I always want us to come back to this one thing. It's about Jesus and it's about following him. The most recent, and here's why, the most recent survey by George Barna, reveals something really, really interesting. He just read this week. Reveals that 6% of Americans have a biblical worldview. 6%. And so I go back to WWJD and I ask the question, is it a slogan or is it a way of life? 6% of Americans have a biblical worldview. And for you and for me to engage in a culture that is opposed to God in every way, we must be solidly rooted in the Word of God. Tony Perkins says it this way, every Christian or follower of Jesus can and should obtain a biblical worldview which is only achieved when a person believes that the Bible is true, authoritative, and then taught how it is applicable to every area of life which enables them to live out those <coughs> beliefs. That also found, this is interesting, that while 51% of adults said they have a biblical worldview, only 6% actually hold to that view. So do you see a challenge here? Do you see a problem? 51% say, oh, I have it. But 6% actually hold to it. And so as followers of Jesus, we move beyond just believing to behaving. That is our behavior is formed by our worldview. It's not the other way around because it's a matter of the heart. Let me show you a quick, quick graph right here, and we're going to move on to Nehemiah in just a second, but you are here. So you have a worldview. I have a worldview, but here's what's important. We don't begin with behavior or values or beliefs because behavior rarely impacts a worldview. It doesn't work in, it works out. That's why we talk about a biblical worldview, because the Bible forms our beliefs, forms our value, and forms and our behaviors, impacts our behaviors. It works from the heart out. And so that's why we talk about a biblical worldview. Now, why, why talk about Nehemiah and, and, and other books of the Bible? How does it impact us? So why teach it? So that we can become better students and know more about the Bible? Knowing more about the Bible is really important, but it has got to go beyond knowledge of the Bible. So years ago, when I was in student ministry, it's a few years ago, um, we had a quiz, a quiz team, and, and uh, these guys were crazy good. I'm telling you, they, they literally memorized books of the Bible. And they were really good at what they did. And we had a really, really good team. But I remember emphasizing, look, it's not that you can memorize books of the Bible. That is really good. But if it's only head knowledge, if it's not the heart, then there's a problem. 
So we're not talking about or teaching now the book of Nehemiah so that we can be better historians or we can know more about the Bible. It's asking the question this morning, Jesus, what is it you're going to teach me today about my life so it will change my belief, my values, and impact my behavior? How, how will I go about life being a follower of, of you as I learn more about you? Holy Spirit, teach me today. So that's my prayer as we look at God's Word, we become better followers of Jesus, allowing His Word to mold our thinking and our actions. Now, I want to go back to Ezra for just a moment, because if you were with us a number of weeks ago, like we talked about, we were in the book of Ezra. We took a short break for this mini-series called Fruit, but we were in the book of Ezra. If you've not seen that, I can encourage you to go back and you can look at the archives and get caught up. I'm going to catch us up here uh, really quick. I'm going to, going to try to do that. But as we read the book of Ezra, Nehemiah, we need to understand it, we're really talking about one book. Our Bibles separate them into two books, Ezra, Nehemiah. But it's really one book, Ezra, Nehemiah. And so we see it as one and we read it a, as one. But well, here's what we've learned. Israel is in captivity for a period of 70 years. Now they're there for a reason. Because God used Babylon as a tool or his agent to judge Israel for their disobedience. Now, you remember on that week, and I just mentioned again today, a tool is something that we use to accomplish a purpose, right? And you've got to use the right tool for the right, right? You've got to use the right tool for the right job. So you're not going to use a hammer like to drive in a screw and vice versa. You know, the right tool for the right job. And so God used Babylon as a tool to judge Israel for their disobedience. Now, we may look at that and we go like, well, you mean God? Like, judges? Like, isn't he a God of love? Here's the deal. God is a, um, a judge, and God judges, and God, right, disciplines those he loves. Have you ever come under the hand of God's discipline? Ever? I have. I have. Uh, God, who loves you and me, judges us and, and disciplines us for his good purpose. And what we discovered in Ezra, and as we kind of get into Nehemiah, this 70-year exile was part of God's plan. God used three kings to accomplish his one purpose, to restore Israel and worship of the one true God. You might even remember that week. Three kings, one God. Three kings, one God. And God used key leaders to lead his people. Let me show you just a little graphic real quick, and then we're going to dive into Nehemiah. So here it is. Three returns from exile, 70 years of captivity. And then we talked about Zerubbabel and that remnant that was led out. <clears throat> and then there was this gap about 57 years. We talked about Haggai and Zechariah, um, contemporary prophets during um, that time. And Zechariah said, not by might, and not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. It's a great reminder for me, not just on that Sunday, but every day, like we don't live in our own might, we don't live in our own power. Zechariah reminded us of that. <clears throat> then there was this gap of almost 60 years. Ezra led, people were reformed, and restoration of worship, and so on. And then there's this shorter gap, about 12 years or so. And now we're getting to the book of Nehemiah, three returns from exile, and the wall is going to be rebuilt. So if you have your Bibles, go to Nehemiah chapter 1, or your Bible app makes no difference, whatever, whatever you had. We're just going to, we're going to focus on just one uh, verse. Actually, it's the last verse of chapter 1. And I'm just going to suggest that it is a cornerstone of all that we're going to see happen, and I'll tell you the reason why. Who is Nehemiah? He identifies himself in verse 11, and he says this, I was a cupbearer to the king. A cupbearer to the king. Now, maybe you've read that, and you kind of slid right over it, and you go, okay, that, that, that's cool. He was a cupbearer to the king. But I want to talk to you today about something that is really, really important, and it's this, purpose or position. Purpose or position. Now, um, Historically, the cupbearer of who Nehemiah is, historically, he was a high-ranking official whose duty primarily involved serving wine to the royal table. Now, some of us are going to be like, oh, dude, I love that. <laughs> we'll take that job right there. But he had, he had a purpose that was this, to protect the king and protect the cup. Because 
you know, it was common that, you know, they try to poison the king. So it was the cup bearer's position um, to be sure that the cup was safe. And at times would even taste it or try it to be sure it wasn't poison. How, how would you like that job? And we're going to like, maybe that's for the lowest person, you know. You test it, we'll just see what happens, then we'll give it to the king. But that was not the case. It was, it was the role of the cupbearer. He had to be trustworthy and loyal. And he had the king's confidence because of his character. And because of his character, he was able to exert influence in the royal, royal court. Let me say it this way. <clears throat> Nehemiah made it. Just think about that position. You're cupbearer to the king. You're trusted by the king. You're in the royal court. Because of your character and the person that you were, you could exert major influence over what was taking place. This was Nehemiah's position. He had position. Think about it. I mean, he, he had a position that was sought after perhaps by others. He had position. But here's my question. What if... His position was God's purpose, and that's what we see being played out. What if his position as someone who is trusted and loyal in the king's court, what if it was more about God's purpose than it was his position? The position that he was in was not so that he could live the life of an influencer, and if he had an Instagram account, right, he, like, he would have, like, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands followers, right? Because, like, he's an influencer, right? Or maybe a, his YouTube channel that might be called, like, A Day in the King's Court. Would you follow that? Right? And so maybe, and he would have, like, thousands and maybe hundreds of thousands of subscribers to his you, 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 YouTube channel. So just, just think about it for just a moment. Influencer. I mean, he made it, and he was there, but Nehemiah was not called to be an influ influencer. He was called to be an imitator, one that followed God and who God would use for his purpose. He wasn't called to be an influencer. He was called to be an imitator of one that followed God. Here's what I want you to take away today. God places us in our position for his purpose. God places us in our position for his purpose. Now, I want to talk, talk to you about whatever it is that you're doing. You're a business owner. God's placed you there for his purpose. You're an employee. God's placed you there for his purpose. You are retired. You, you think your influence is over. No, 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 no. God, you are there for God's purpose. Um. Think about all of life. God has placed you there for his purpose. What if we begin changing our thinking and we begin to look at the place that we are, the position that we have as part of God's plan for our life, as part of his purpose? This is Nehemiah saying, look, I'm here, but God, I'm here to serve you. I am here, but I am there. Now, with Nehemiah, we're going to see this as we kind of unfold the book of Nehemiah. This is what it meant. It meant that he was going to face a ton of opposition, a ton of challenge in his life. This was not going to be easy. This was going to be difficult from man's view. But he was committed to serving out God's purpose in his life. What if you begin, and what if, what if I begin to see our, my position, what if you begin to see your position as his purpose for your life, regardless of where you are today? What if when Jesus said, follow me, you chose to follow him, and it meant that your life would be lived for his purpose? Another question. What if your today was part of God's tomorrow. What if when you laid your head on your pillow tonight, you looked back over today and said, my today is part of your purpose tomorrow, 
God, I don't know what it is. I don't know how you'll lead me. But my today is a part of your purpose tomorrow. My position is a part of your purpose. More on that in just a moment. God places us and intends to use the gifts and the talents that he has given to serve him and to bring glory to his name and to live out his purpose in our life. So this means we're going to think differently. So let me challenge you with something right here. What we begin to do is, is look at our purpose and position in a different order. So rather than our position driving our purpose, we kind of flip that around. We go like, no, my purpose is to serve God, and that will impact my position. What if we change our thinking just a little bit? What would your life look like? What would mine look like? How would I face life differently? How would I face my day-to-day challenges in life differently if it wasn't about position, it was about purpose? And we live for God's purpose, and my position is really secondary. Here's what that means, because I think some of us could sit here and go like, okay, let's go back to Nehemiah, right? I get that. Um, He was in a really good place in his life, and that is true. I mean, cut bare, right? Influencer, like we all agree, like he made it. It was easy, and it would be easy if I could just be there, if I could just get there. I, I could do that right there. But my marriage is broken. I lost my business. My career is over. <laughs> my relationships are in the toilet. I've been working hard, and someone said it years ago, and it's, it's a good way to look at it. I've been climbing the ladder, but it was on the wrong, leaning up against the wrong wall. I've been working so hard, and, and it's all God, and you feel broken, and you feel like you have no purpose in life. What if you're there and not in the position of Nehemiah? What if you're today, regardless of where you are, is actually part of God's purpose for your life? What about tonight when you go to sleep? You think, God, something about today, and I don't know how you're going to use it, but I'm committed to your purpose rather than my position in life. I'm going to step out of the book of Nehemiah for just a moment because I want to illustrate this in another way. Um, so part of my morning routine um, is I, I pray the Psalms. So I just have that routine. It's part of, part of the morning for me. And I landed on a Psalm I'm going to share with you in just a moment that ties right into what we're, to what we're talking about. Um, remember Joseph, not, not Joseph and Mary, but Joseph way back in the Old Testament, remember the dude with what, a coat of yeah, lots of colors, right? Son of Jacob and Rachel. I mean, if you landed Genesis 41, you go like, yeah, he made it too. Here, here's what it says. Since God has shown you all this in uh, the interpretation of Pharaoh's dream, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. I mean, that's the part of the story like we love to focus on, right? That's, that's great, man. That, that's cool, right? Um, but what about if you're just at that point today where you're just going to toss in the towel and you feel like you have no purpose because, like, life has taken a twist and a turn. The Bible says that his brother saw this dreamer coming, and when they saw him, they kind of hatched this plan, right? First it was, let's, let's just off him. Let's kill him. Let's get rid of him. But then... You know, one of the guys goes, no, we can't, do, we can't do that. Let's just throw him in this pit. And so, and so that's, that's what he did, did. So Joseph gets tossed into this pit, and he's all alone. He's abandoned by his own family. He's in the pit. They're having a barbecue, eating. And there he is, abandoned. And Joseph today wasn't looking so good, was it? It was a challenge, man. It, I'm in a pit. I don't know what they're going to do. My today isn't so good. And then he gets sold into slavery. And then he ends up in prison for like a number of years. And people debate how many, but it was a long time. He had a whole bunch of todays, didn't he? He did. But God had a purpose. 
God had a purpose. And the psalmist, is where we're going, psalmist captures it in Psalm 105. Just think about this now. Today is a part of God's purpose tomorrow. So I don't care where you're at in life. Things might be really, going really, 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 really good. That's for God's purpose in life for you. Things might be challenging to you right now. You might feel abandoned. Things might be going really wrong and really challenging. Listen, what if that's a part of God's purpose tomorrow? Because it is. Just listen from Psalm 105. When he summoned a famine on the land and broke all supply of bread, he had sent a man ahead of them. Who sent him? He sent a man ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. He sent a man ahead of them. His feet were hurt with fetters. His neck was put in a collar of iron until what he had said came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. And the king sent and released him. The ruler of all the people set him free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions to bind his princes at his pleasure and to teach his elders wisdom. What does it all come down to today? Your purpose given by God is greater than your position. What if we start looking at life like that today? Would that change your approach to the day? It does mine. Do I have to be reminded of that from time to time? Sometimes almost every day. Well, I want to invite us into just a moment of prayer and maybe a brand new commitment, whether you're online or here in person. And it's just saying, God, um, here I am. Things might be going well. Things might be really challenging. It really doesn't make any difference. Your purpose is greater than my position right now. So I just commit my life to you. Use me as you will to carry out your good purpose in life. So I'm going to invite you to stand in person and join me online. Can we do that right now? I'm going to ask you to do something this morning. Um, you can do this physically. Uh, and if, if you're not comfortable with that, just do it. Do it in your heart. We're just giving God our lives today. And you can hold out your hands like this if you like. Saying, God, regardless of my position, regardless of what I'm facing in life today, things might be going really, really well. I give my life to you. It's all about you. It's all about your good purpose in life, making disciples and seeing your gospel go forward. God, I give my life to you. For some of us, life is really challenging right now. God, I give that to you. I might feel like I'm in a pit. I might feel like I've been completely abandoned, and maybe I have, maybe you have by others, but God, I give that to you right now. I pray that your good purpose will prevail in my life. In Jesus' name, amen.